Hello, my name is Neil Briscoe. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Cloud Gateway, the UK's first SASE platform. Today, uh, I'm going to discuss SASE, which is Secure Access Service Edge, uh, fight through the marketing spiel, break down some of the components and actually give some pros and cons and actually see if it fits well within the United Kingdom. A couple of years ago, Gartner defined SASE Secure Access Service Edge as a consolidation of network and security services delivered as a service from the cloud. Now to date, the main tenets of, uh, of SASE have been SD-WAN, Secure Web Gateway Services, Zero Trucks Network Access and Firewall as a Service. Now today, I'm going to go through these components and, and debunk some of the myths and actually what they are in old money and is SASE marketing spin or is it a valid architecture for uh, the next uh, transition uh, into the cloud? It's worthwhile remembering that SASE is actually a framework, it's not a product, it's not a platform, it's a number of services, security services and network services combined um, together. Now, we're going to take a look at the first one, uh, which I mentioned was SD-WAN. Now, SD-WAN has been around for a number of years and it's one of the main tenants uh, of SASE. So I'm just going to explain um, uh, about the, the, the concept of SD-WAN and where it fits into SASE. So SD-WAN came about many years ago because the advent of the internet and the fact that MPLS is dead. Well, sadly, MPLS is not dead and people thought it was a damn sight cheaper to start using the internet to connect back to their data centers, or in this case, a SASE fabric. Now, an SD-WAN is a service where an appliance is placed on your site. And traditionally, if you're gonna do SD-WAN properly, is that it connects to your perceived expensive MPLS, where it's a private network, and using commodity internet to both connect back from your site to your data center and your applications here. Now, in the UK, the price of MPLS and internet are not vastly different. Now, with the traditional SD-WAN, the idea is that your um, time-sensitive um, data would go via MPLS because it's a private, it's got an S SLA. But if you wanted to go across to the internet or your, your least uh, preferable applications, you go across the internet. And also, built into SD-WAN, you had secure web gateway services or firewall services. Now, there's this misconception in the UK that, hey, I've got local breakout from my site, and hey, I'm going to eBay. And from my site, I can go this way to go to my data center, but instead of tromboning to the data center to go to the internet, hey, I'm gonna go straight out the internet. Unfortunately, the likeliness is, from your site, you very rarely go straight to the internet. That internet provider will go back to a data center, probably based out of links in London, then it will go out to eBay. So the misconception that everything goes out locally and from a performance perspective, you will go via a data center anyway and back out. However, one of the benefits of um, SD-WAN is the fact that you get a single pane of glass is that you can use multiple different carrier methods, so MPLS, internet, you can have 4G, and away you go, and the service will detect which is the best for the option for that particular traffic flow and use those directions. Now, in the UK, I don't particularly believe this works well, as I said, because the, the cost of an MPLS circuit or an internet circuit is roughly the same. However, if you're gonna be going on the internet, and you're going to be plugging using the internet as, as your main WAN, is that you're going to have to buy the routers and the firewalls and the proxies and everything else, all your security appliances there. So the total cost of ownership of using the internet um, may be a false economy. Now, alongside um, with SD-WAN is you'll get um, secure web gateway services. As I mentioned down here, some devices, SD1, will have a web gateway services down here that will have URL filtering. SWG, or Secure Web Gateway Services, as part of SASE, is effectively extracting these areas uh, and these components from your site and centralizing them in the data center. So another tenant, as I mentioned, is Secure Web Gateway Services, or SWGs. Effectively, you've got your SASE platform here, and in there is all the services that you love and know. 
So you've got your deep packet inspection, um, you've got your URL filtering, you've got your proxies, you've got your IPS and IDS. All we're doing on this way is, that could be your WAN, is we're taking those services from here and migrating them to use them centrally. The advantage of doing this is you remove an appliance sprawl. You can remove all your appliances down here and most importantly, you've got a centralised enforcement point between your enterprise and the internet and you get a consistent approach on how you do that. Now, the, the Secure Web Gateway Services is just an amalgamation of services and products that we've known for the last 20 years. So firewalls, proxies, IPS, IDS. There's nothing mystical or magical about that. Again, marketing's got in the way. Same with SD-WAN to some extent. SD-WAN, under the hood, is actually numerous components been put together in a marketing brand. Although I do accept uh, personally that um, the, the automation and the zero touch provisioning makes a, 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 a compelling algorithm for using it. However, if we look at the main components underneath that, it's just IPsec tunnels. We've been using those for years and years. It's either DMVPN um, or IPsec with GRE. Um, under the hood, we've got network-based application recognition. We've got IPSLA, which will do all the detection as if the, 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 the traffic path is more suitable on this side than the other. And effectively, all these are services that have been around for 20 years anyway, they're just wrapped up in an SD-WAN service offering. So these are two of the main pillars uh, of SASE um, that we've currently got. SD-WAN, using your any carrier method to get to your application and your data center services. And when you're going out to the internet, ensuring that you've got a single enforcement point with all these services that we've known and loved previously, but we're now calling them secure web gateway services under the hood. Although benefits of doing this is it's ultimately scalable and you're paying for it as a service. On the next um, session, um, I'm going to describe uh, zero trust network access and the advent and what's going to happen to VPNs. Again, services that we've known for the last 20 years. Now I'm going to discuss zero trust network access. Now, this has come around because apparently the client VPN is dead. Um, I'm here today to tell you it's not. But before we get to that point, let's have a look at what zero trust network access is. And again, it's built together with a load of services that we love and know of the last 20 years, but wrapped up in a marketing um, uh, banner. So zero trust network access. With the advent of everything moving to cloud, so this could be any cloud service provider, you've got your app sitting here. And as we know, more and more people are on the internet and working from home or could be working within the office. Now, traditionally, what we'd have is we'd maybe have a data center where you'd have a VPN endpoint and there'd be a little client that sits on there and you connect on there, maybe with two-factor authentication, maybe not. And it's effectively, it's the old style remote working from there. Now, uh, up until this date, this has worked perfectly well. But what we're getting now more and more is these applications may be hosted in your cloud providers or it could be with SaaS. And we want some sort of level of control of who can have access to those applications and not. And more importantly, making sure that that device um, is not trusted. So it's effectively whether you're inside the network or outside the network, you are not to be trusted and each session needs to be authenticated, not just from a user perspective, but down to a device perspective. Now, if we take a look at some of the components of zero trust network access, they are the stuff that we've known before. So it's effectively, often, a web application firewall that sits in front of your applications. It could be effectively a reverse proxy that sits in front of your firewalls, uh, sit in front of your applications. In there, it may be linked to multi-factor authentication. It may be linked to an IDP, whether it's Active Directory or Radius or TACAX or any other service. Another thing that Zero Trust Network Access, uh, which is a big differentiator from the old style, is posture checking. So we can actually set a policy that said, this application needs to be protected. This user is out on the internet. So we want to do a few checks. As the user comes in, seamlessly accessing this URL, there's no client to spin up to spin down. There's actually an agent sits there silently and transparently. As it comes in, we're doing a few things. 
we're checking, has this machine got um, virus protection on there? Isn't this machine a certain serial number? Is this machine a certain um, operating system version? Uh, is this machine, does it need to be sandboxed? Isn't this machine declared stolen or not? So we're doing the posture check of that. With the authentication coming through, it's going to hit a WAF or reverse proxy. At that point, the session is going to come through and we're going to check, does it need multi-factor authentication? Do we need to put in a token on top there? Is it authenticated against Active Directory or Azure AD? Is this user allowed to do this? Now, to get through to the access, you need to tick all these boxes. And every time the session starts, the user transparently goes to this URL. It's doing all these checks. If it ticks every single one, we're going through and we're accessing it. Once the user closes the browser and shuts it down, all of these sessions get cleared down. And next time the user wants to go to this application, we're doing all the same checks. Now, you could have 100 applications at the back here, and from a user perspective, it's transparent. Now, if we look down at the technologies, posture assessment, we've had that um, with, with end user and clients, um, VPN clients for, for years. WAF, reverse proxy, multi-factor authentication, and IDPs, we've had there. Now, as I mentioned before, the VPN client is dead. Well, it's not, really, because the vast majority of these applications are using HTTPS. It's using um, the, the web browser. It's using web-based applications. If you've got applications that are not available or not able to be proxied or to be presented with HTTPS, what do you do? Now, in a greenfield site, in a greenfield world, everything, all applications will be based on the internet and all applications will be web-based. But unfortunately, there's some data centers with some old legacy databases that are on there. There's applications in there that are 20 years old plus that will not remediate and cannot be published in this method. So this is why at Cloud Gateway, we take the Zero Trust Network access, but we still have the ability to do WAF, multi-factor authentication, reverse proxy, an IDP and posture assessment using a standard SSL VPN that caters for still having access to all those horrible applications that cannot be done. And then what happens, once these have been remediated, moved into the Zero Trust Network Access model, you can start to remove these. Unfortunately, what we're seeing too often nowadays is that everything is Zero Trust Network Access and poo-pooing the old traditional VPNs when we still need the old VPNs because a lot of enterprises are not ready to go straight to cloud or they've got legacy applications that are not going to go away anytime soon. I'm now going to wipe this out and then what we're going to do now is discuss how at Cloud Gateway we've taken the SASE model and then expanded it further from on-net cloud connectivity. Now we've gone through some of the main components of SASE, let's talk about why cloud and why we've gone and built everything in cloud as opposed to traditional on-prem stuff. So at Cloud Gateway, we've built a large SASE fabric where we have all the components, as mentioned before, SD-WAN, secure web gateway services, we've got firewall as a service, we've got zero trust network access, uh, and we've got traditional SSL VPNs. Now, one of the main things that we moved to SASE for, and it was all about built in the cloud, what we've done with our SASE fabric is if we've extended this further to be completely agnostic because we appreciate that not everybody is going to be completely cloud native from day one. So effectively what we've done, we've extended our fabric so that you can connect to AWS, you can connect to Azure, you can connect to Google Cloud Platform, on net immediately provisioned. We've also made it easy for our customers to onboard with us to take these services is that we've got multiple pops around the UK in physicals uh, and we've got multiple pops around the world in the virtual the SASE aspect as, uh, of it so that customers can connect uh, up to us. In the UK, we've also got access to the health and social care network, effectively the NHS's backbone and we've also got on-net access to the public services network, which is predominantly used for the central government. So we've built this platform that everything is automatable and you can pick and choose and take these services uh, as you see fit. Now, we've built our platform in the cloud with physical presences so that people are on board. Now, why have we built it in the cloud? Well, traditionally, um, the cloud 
for development and all the applications ran far, far ahead. Now networking was the last thing to catch up. Now we are playing catch up and we are getting there. So the reason why we can do it in cloud is that we've got the ultimate agility. We don't have your traditional telcos of taking 90 to 120 days to provision a circuit. Now that you're able to spin up these services via an API, press a button and you have a full secure web gateway stack, which would have taken you months and months to do. Also, the, uh, we've got it in a cloud commercial model. Whereas previously, if you wanted a one gig circuit into your building, um, but you may or may not go to two gig at some point, you had to provision a 10 gig bearer up front and you had to pay for that and size it appropriately. And you may, from a use perspective, you may only be using a certain amount. All this would be wastage. Now, you're able to pay for what you use and pay for what you need. So you've got the, 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 the commercial scale to be able to take these services um, uh, as and when you need them. And it's the same from a, from a time perspective. We do it in cloud is that we don't incur costs. If they, if they come to the end of the contract or you've done a digital transformation or migration and you don't need these services, we can simply turn them off and at that point you charge, charge no more. Whereas previously you had to cater for your data centre contracts, they may be three years, your WAN providers, they may be three years, and you had to pay for the OPEX and CAPEX through a managed service provider to be able to provide these services. Now they're on demand. Uh, and, and there's no reason why you can't take all these services as and when you um, need them. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions, please go to uh, cloudgateway.co.uk. Thank you very much.